Hello and welcome to the I Want to Know podcast. I am Josh Spector and I am your host. If you don't know who I am, I'm the creator of the For the Interested newsletter, which you can check out at fortheinterested.com. If you're new here, this podcast exists for a simple reason, to help creative entrepreneurs get their questions answered. Here's how it typically works. In each episode, a different guest comes on and asks me three questions. We have a 10-minute conversation about each of them, and that's it. No fluff, lots of actionable tips and strategies that you can put to use to grow your audience and business. But today's episode is going to be a little bit different. Today, I'm going to flip the script. Instead of someone coming on and asking me questions, I brought on a special guest whose expertise I want to learn from. And I, along with you guys who are watching and listening, will hopefully learn a lot from her as I ask her the three questions. A quick note before I introduce her, if you're watching or listening to this show, I assume it's because you're interested in growing your audience or business, either that or you just somehow got really lost on the internet. Either way, if you're interested in learning simple, non-shady ways to grow, then you should check out my skill sessions. There are a series of one-hour video presentations where I teach how to do things like get clients, create a product in a day, define your niche, grow your newsletter, all based on things that I have done myself. You can check them out at joshspector.com slash sessions. And if you like my podcast, you will absolutely love my skill sessions. Okay. Now let's get on to today's guest. And today's guest is Chanel Basilio. Chanel runs Growth in Reverse, where she reverse engineers how top creators grew their newsletter to 50,000 plus subscribers. Each week, she spends around 25 hours researching a creator and writes a deep dive, sharing some of the growth strategies they've used. You can also find her on Twitter at ChanelCo, talking about newsletters and building an audience. I am thrilled to have her on the show. It is a fantastic newsletter. I was just saying before we got started, I asked her how long she's been doing it. She said about six months, which is crazy because it is everywhere. Hello, Chanel. Welcome and thanks for doing this. Thanks, Josh. That was very kind words. I appreciate that. You know, it's funny when I do these expert episodes, I know a thing or two about newsletters and it's rarely with a fellow newsletter expert. It's usually YouTube experts and people who know things that I don't know as much about. But your newsletter, I think, has been so successful. It's unique. It's interesting. You've really studied the space uh, literally on a weekly basis. I was excited to have you on, and I hate the phrase, pick your brain, but I guess I'll use the phrase, pick your brain. So let's jump right into it. And I want to start here. Your newsletter is heavily rooted in research. So let's say that someone who's listening to this or watching this episode Let's say they want to write an amazing profile, a blog post. They want to produce a great video. They want to do something about someone that they don't know personally or maybe don't have access to to just interview them. How should they go about doing that? Because I, and I'm making an assumption here that a lot of the people you profile, you have not actually interviewed. Is that correct? Yep, exactly. Okay, cool. So how would you suggest someone approach doing that research? Where do they start? What do they look for? How do they compile and filter it? Talk to me a little bit about your process and how you find this stuff and put it all together. Sure. So I think the first thing you have to consider is where are they creating their work, right? If they're mm -hmm. writing a newsletter, are they on Twitter a lot? That kind of thing. So you kind of have to start from what they actually do, and then you can dig in deeper there. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's usually listening to podcast interviews they've done, just Googling their name or the name of their business, looking on YouTube, wherever they really create content is where I start. From there, I'm just looking for what I want to know. So I'm looking how they grew their newsletter. So I'll research, I'll go on Twitter, do advanced searches and figure out, you know, if they mention subscribers anywhere or do they mention their newsletter URL and then dig in further and I don't know, start compiling mm -hmm. notes from there. Are there people that you have wanted to profile that you start going down that research process and you're like, I just, I can't find enough stuff. How do you know when you're researching, like what is quote unquote enough to work with? Yeah, that's a good question. I think usually I can find enough information or data. The one last week was actually difficult on Ben Mir because he has literally mm -hmm. done no podcasts. And that's usually right. where I find a bulk of my information. Right. So I bought his course and just, I didn't share what's in his course, but I'll look mm -hmm. and see what he does and figure it out on the back end that way. And then it's it was really just like going deeper into Twitter than I usually do. But there are people I have started doing research on and then I completely canceled the whole thing because there wasn't a good story or I didn't think people could learn from it very well. Mm -hmm. So that does so happen. talk to me about, I love that you use that phrase, there wasn't a good story. So talk, let's define 
you know, what is a good story, right? You can, for most people, if they've been on podcasts, they've been on Twitter, let's assume that you can find enough information about them. How do you sort of go about finding what that story or hook is? So the whole point of the newsletter is me figuring out how they grew theirs. So that will help me grow my own and helping mm -hmm. other people grow their newsletter. So if there's not anything that's like compelling or different or replicable, I think that's where I draw the line. There was one recently where the person just, the topic was so good that just spread everywhere. And I just don't think that you could replicate that success in a way. So I just mm -hmm. can that one. I don't know. It's hard to say because I usually find that like really good hook on Friday before right. the Sunday newsletter goes out. Yeah. It's just, yeah. I was going to say, how far in, how far in advance are you working? And do you have a list of people that are potential candidates and you're researching as you go and then say, okay, now I'm committed to this one or you just one at a time going through it? Yeah. I wish I was that organized with it, Josh. Um, hey. For the most part, I have a list and then I'll just scan through it every week and be like, all right, that one, let's try that. And I'll start researching that person. I often, flip back and forth on the Monday and I'll be like, oh, let's change it mm -hmm. up. But yeah, I mean, I just start researching and then I'll hopefully find something compelling by like Tuesday, Wednesday. And if not, I'll change it up. And that usually puts me on a really tight deadline there. <laughs> Are there, and obviously you're searching for the person that you're going to write about and then finding, you know, let's say, say for podcasts, whatever podcast they happen to be on. But are there certain podcasts that you find a lot of your people have been on this podcast? Are there certain podcasts that you wind up listening to a lot of their episodes because a lot of your people are on them and sort of where are the places that you find yourself consuming a lot? So, I mean, our mutual friend, Jay Klaus, his podcast, mm -hmm. Creator Science, a lot of the guests are usually on his as well. Mm -hmm. Danny Miranda is another one that has a lot of the guests on there. Nick Loper has Side Hustle Nation. His mm -hmm. podcast is usually chock full of people too. In the beginning, I actually started using those podcasts to get ideas for people. And now I have ideas coming from people on Twitter tagging me or that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Cool. So obviously you've been doing it for a while now. So what has changed, if anything, about your research process? I would guess that there are things that you've learned that maybe have made you more efficient at it, or maybe there are things or sources that you look at now that you didn't consider in the beginning, sort of how has research evolved for you in the process of doing this? It's definitely evolved. I still do most of the things the same, I'm starting to get faster with certain things and I've built out like a checklist of places to look, which is helpful mm -hmm. instead of just like floundering around trying to find information. Yeah. I mean, I've just gone much deeper into 10, 10th and 11th page on Google and that's usually where I find some good stuff too. I was going to say, how are you compiling? So you're consuming all this stuff. How are you compiling and then organizing that research? So I'll start in the beginning. I usually... So once I pick a person, I will typically go through and find all of the podcasts they've been on. And then I'll create a playlist. And then I do probably like Mondays and Tuesdays. I go on four to five mile walks and I'll try and get as mm. many listened to as I can, taking notes while I walk. And then I come back on Wednesday and sit down and compile what I've learned, go deeper on certain things. Like I heard someone mention this specific, I don't know, tweet they had that went really well. And I'll go mm -hmm. find the tweet and see why I did good, those kinds of things. And then I'll just start digging deeper into Google and YouTube while I'm sitting at my desk. And are you so funny? I'm so not a tech stack guy. I think it's like the least important part of like almost everything, but people are obsessed with what app are you using? So I'll ask it anyway. Are you taking notes in just your like Apple notes app? Are you using notion? Like how, like, what do you use to organize stuff? I really want to be a notion person, but I'm not. So I just keep going back to Apple notes because it's quick and it syncs to everything. So that's no. really the one that I use. I have to say, and maybe this is just my own personal bias, but I feel like when I have conversations with people that have built or are building sort of successful things, very rarely are they the ones that have these elaborate, like notion, second brain, all this like elaborate stuff. Like most times, again, maybe this is my own personal bias, but I feel like most of the people that are actually having success are spending less time sort of tracking all their stuff. And using very basic, I use my notes app. I have a simple to-do list. I have a whatever. Yeah. So it doesn't shock me that you're like, yeah, I just keep it simple. In your mind, when you're doing the research, because obviously you're doing growth stories, right? So there is a sort of built-in narrative and trajectory there. But do you, in your own mind, have an organizing principle where it's, I always know I'm going to have the sort of origin story. And then I always know there's going to be this sort of, or in most of these cases, there was a spike, there was a something happened. Are there the equivalent of beats of the story that you see over and over again? For sure. Yeah. So some people, I mean, they just have 
one thing that really helped project them like much higher than they would have gone otherwise. But a lot of them are just like really slow and gradual. Not slow <laughs> usually, but <laughs> gradual, I would say. But yeah, I mean, there are definitely things that carry through all of the interviews. Do you ever or have you ever actually interviewed people, the people you're writing about? Or are you really just using third party research? It's really third party. I think Pat Walls, I asked him a question because mm -hmm. there was one point where he had like over 200,000 subscribers. And then a couple of weeks later, he had posted on Twitter that he had 115,000. And I was like, whoa, what happened mm -hmm. here? Because usually the growth timeline that I create, it's like a chart that shows all of their metrics. And it usually just goes up and to the right. And his was mm -hmm. like up and then tanked. And I was like, I need to reach out and ask him. So right. I just sent him a LinkedIn message. But it was just a quick question. And is that, I'm curious, is there, is that something you've considered doing? Like why the decision not to actually speak to the people themselves? Obviously it's easier logistically, but you know, now at this point you're, you know, you're pretty established. Is that something you you're considering doing or you just view it as a sort of a separate thing? I definitely considered it. I think in the beginning it was more of nobody knew who I was and I didn't feel like they would necessarily want to spend that much time, mm -hmm. you know, going through and re going back through their history and their story. But now, yeah, I mean, I've had people who I've done deep dives on that ask, like, when are you going to do interviews? So I'll probably right. end up doing that soon. Cool. Okay, so let's shift to let's shift to my second question for you. Obviously, in the process of doing this, you have studied a lot of successful creators for your newsletter, and I'm sure you've learned a ton in the process. So I'm curious, what are the most surprising things that you've noticed that most of them have in common? And then also, what's something you've learned that has changed the way you approach your own creations? Let's start with what has surprised you that, you know, both, and I guess I'm going to ask this in sort of two parts, right? So one part is, you know, what have you noticed? What are the threads, the through lines that most of these people have that you didn't necessarily ex expect? And then also, I'm sure there's a couple outliers where you're like, this one is on its own island, like they did something totally different. So what are the things that really have kind of surprised you and stood out to you? I think when I got started, I initially thought that I was going to find stories of people who just took off and they have no backstory and they just came into it and had 50,000 subscribers like overnight. But and that sounds silly now, like thinking about it. But the one thing I found is it really does take two to three years. Like there's mm. no ifs, ands or buts about it. And even some of the stories like Justin Walsh, who I know you had on your podcast. Yeah. You could look at his story and he started his newsletter like not that long ago. And now he's at like 130,000 subscribers or something. But mm -hmm. he had that built in history of that LinkedIn. Like he was yeah. on LinkedIn for so long before he even started. So, yeah, I mean, I remember it's funny because I remember talking to him when he had been on LinkedIn and he was just starting to use Twitter. It was so funny because I had, for whatever reason, I had, I was working on a project or something, but I had some exchange with him and I had written down, I actually had noted somewhere like how many Twitter followers he had. And, you know, he had like maybe 10,000. Two months later, he has a hundred, you know, whatever he's at now. But yeah, but right, because he's bringing that LinkedIn audience. But yeah, it's crazy. So what else has surprised you? So what else has surprised me is that most people use a lot of the similar strategies, like they may have done something differently, but all of them have built good relationships with other creators. Like that's mm -hmm. a big one. It's not surprising necessarily, but it's just interesting to hear that. And then the consistency piece of it is huge as well. I think that often goes with building those relationships is once you're writing for enough time, like people are like, oh, they're going to be here for a while and they'll like mm -hmm. give you the time of day. So it's almost, I don't know, the relationship piece has been interesting to see. And even I'm doing research now and I'll find relationships about creators I did a deep dive on five months ago and be like, oh, I totally missed that back then. But they were linked up with this person. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really interesting. Like the world is a lot smaller than you think it is. I love that you mentioned the relationship thing, because I think it's one of the biggest sort of hidden levers that people just do not realize how important a role it plays and not just with like huge creators, but even, you know, even going from a newbie to intermediate level or whatever, you know, whatever that means, it's massive. And I think people, because they see what people are posting and they see that, and I think a lot of times they make this assumption that those are the things that are driving that growth and or people that aren't growing get really frustrated because they go, I don't understand. My tweets are just as good as this person's. My newsletter is just as good as this person's. Why are they taking off and I'm not? And they just don't see that behind the scenes. And I'm not even talking about engagement pods. Like that's a whole other, you know, that's a whole other thing. 
but just genuinely those relationships, they don't see that, oh, I featured that person's tweet or that person's newsletter in my newsletter because I had a conversation with them or it came to my attention or whatever, right? There's all those sort of hidden things happening that I think really are impacting the growth of stuff. And a lot of times, not only do people not realize that, they might be modeling what someone does thinking that's the key to growth, right? Oh, if I tweet the way that person does, that's going to make me grow. And it's no, it's not the tweets that should have been modeled. It's the relationships, but you don't see that because how would you see that? And, you know, it's definitely something that I have found for myself. And I, to be honest, don't think I do nearly enough of it. But anytime I've even just had a friendly conversation, hey, let's hop on a Zoom for 10 minutes and say hi outside of Twitter, you know, it might be a year later when I have something to be like, hey, you know, I thought your audience might like this. But those things make a huge difference. And I think it is really hidden. Right. And not a lot of people talk about it, except for, as I'm sure you found, when you start studying these people that have gotten to a certain point, almost always there's some version of relationships that have played a role. A hundred percent. And that's yeah. one of the things that's hard for me to do is like I'm studying their growth, but I can't go into their DMs and look in the past. You know, mm. that's just completely blocked off. So I have to go and try and figure out who they were tweeting at most and like how they were connecting and find different relationships off of Twitter and that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's just interesting. You know, what's interesting too, is I think even the creators themselves, a lot of times aren't even consciously thinking about it. Like they sort of take it for granted. You know, I've had conversations with a client or they're trying to figure something out or they're trying to get to certain types of people. I'll find myself going, oh, I know this person and this person, and I can introduce you here and that. And I don't even really think about it. But I realize, like, I've developed this network over time. And I, a lot of times I only notice it when someone says to, you know, in reaction to that of like, how do you know all these people? Oh, you know that person and you can just DM them and you can whatever. And it's, oh, yeah, I guess over time. But that also goes back to your other point where like this stuff takes time. It doesn't happen over overnight. Far from it. What else have you noticed that most, most successful creators have in common? I mean, there's the element of content, right? So it has to be like something like th your content has to be super good and something people can't find elsewhere, whether even if you're just curating links, like you have a really good eye for content that's mm -hmm. interesting for people. Otherwise, like a Cody Sanchez has like these amazing real world experiences that she can share. That's interesting. That's good mm -hmm. content. So it, that's a really important piece that I think it's overlooked a lot like people just are like i'm just gonna create a newsletter about this one thing and i'll just figure out how to grow it really fast and it's okay but are people gonna share it is it actually mm. something people want to send to their friends yeah so that's important have you found that i'm gonna make an assumption here but feel free to tell me if i'm crazy i assume that most people that have grown to a certain point they have a real clarity in who their audience is or who their target audience is. And just as importantly, like what they're helping them do. I find a lot of times the people that are not growing or are stuck, it's way too vague. It's way too vague or way too broad. This gets into niche, but I also think like niche also in terms of specificity, I would, again, this is an assumption, but you know, tell me if it's, if you found this as well. That most of the people that you featured, they know exactly who they're trying to help and what they're trying to help them do. Yeah. Again, that doesn't always happen right away. Yeah. I still question like who is on my newsletter and are they really beginners or complete mm -hmm. experts? A mixture. Like I know some of that, but it's still not a perfect, I don't have yeah. that dialed in super well. But yeah, I mean, and a lot of people start doing something a little bit more niche and then they expand their horizons a mm -hmm. little bit. I think it's important. Yeah. And have you found also, cause it's, that's also something I talk about a lot that like, you know, people get very like hesitant and scared of niching down because they feel like they're going to be trapped in something. But I think every niche is always evolving. And I would imagine a lot of the people that you have featured, like it has evolved, like they know who they're trying to serve now and how they're trying to serve them. But it probably looks very different than it did at the very beginning. Yeah. Maybe it got narrower. Maybe it got broader. Maybe it shifted all of that kind of stuff. But that evolution, I think, at least I've found is also very much a part of successful growth among creators. Like they're willing to have it continue to evolve based on their own changing interests and also what the feedback and the response they're getting from the audience as it goes. 
Yeah. And I think that kind of also ties back into the whole like it takes time piece. And I actually think that's a good thing because (laughs) when you're starting out, like your content is probably not going to be good and you don't want 50,000 people reading it in the beginning because you're going to just lose a lot of those people. So I think as you grow, like it's good to start small because then you can get better and refine your content, figure out who you're talking to and what you actually like about the content and then start building on that. So I think it's actually good to start small. Perfect. So let's talk about with that in mind, let's shift it to you, right? You're literally on a weekly, daily basis studying all these people. So how has your work, your newsletter evolved as a result of the things that you've been learning? I think in the beginning, I was really stuck on this 50,000 subscriber number. And I still think it's important to have some level of, I don't know how how I want to say this, but it just shows that somebody's in this for the long run for me to actually go and do a deep dive on them. But there are also people like a Steph Smith who, you know, she's probably making high six figures, maybe seven figures, but she Mm -hmm. has 10,000 subscribers, maybe less. So there are people that I would like to you know, research that don't necessarily have the 50,000 subscribers. Mm. I think that's going to evolve here soon, but it's also That's so interesting. I would have absolutely guessed she had way more than 10,000. Because yeah, I mean, she does great stuff and she's got, I don't know how many Twitter followers she has, whatever, but she clearly has an audience and is, you know, is influential. I'm surprised to hear that she has so few. And you know what's funny? And this is another thing too, like to point out, I catch myself getting, oh, she has so few subscribers, but I actually think those metrics are way over, to your point, like they're way overrated anyway. I have, I think, like 44,000 subscribers or whatever to my newsletter now. But there are people with less than, you know, like Steph Smith has just as much influence and probably more than I do with 10,000 subscribers. And then there are people that I know that have 80,000, 100,000 subscribers, but my newsletter is a lot more impactful than theirs is. We get so overly swayed by these metrics that are, It's not that they're meaningless, but they're not as important as lots of people make them out to be. And this is also where niche, it makes a huge difference. So I have a client that is in a B2B, very small niche industry. And I started helping them with their newsletter a few years ago. And one of the first questions that I asked them was, I was like, look, how many, before we even start this thing, what is the possible audience? Like, how big is this industry And, you know, and I remember we had that conversation and they were like, look, this newsletter could only possibly ever be relevant to probably 5,000 subscribers, but it's super relevant and super valuable for them. And they've now been doing it for a couple of years and, you know, they have almost 2000 subscribers, which sounds like nothing, but it's 50% of that industry. It's massive and incredibly valuable for them. And I think that's the other thing that people need to take into account. I see a lot of people that are and we're talking about newsletters, but it's true of podcasts, YouTube channel, it's true of any content. They're creating content for a very small, very specific, potentially very valuable niche. But then they're looking at these other metrics and feeling like a failure because they don't have 50,000 subscribers. That's not the point. Like you're, you know, what are you actually trying to get out of this? Again, using that example of one of my clients, like for them to have 2000 subscribers is massive uh, and massively valuable in that universe. So what else? What other things have you learned that have influenced how you do things? Well, I think just on that note, like you're talking about 2000 people and the sponsorship opportunities they probably have are crazy because you're reaching Mm -hmm. almost half of that entire audience. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah. And the knowledge they get, which is this is another thing with newsletters that I think people don't talk about enough is the ability to see, especially if you're curating and it's a curated newsletter and that kind of thing. The ability to see what people are interested in is super valuable, depending what you do and not just see it from based on a survey, but able to go, you know what, when we put links about this thing, people click. And then to be able to even, again, within their industry, they're able to go in and go, oh, this person who works at this company, click this article about how to deal with downsizing. That's pretty valuable insider information of how what's going on. And again, you can only do that if you're smart about also how you use your newsletter and share things. Yes, you want to share things that are valuable, but you also may want to share things that are going to sort of surface based on the click data, who's trying to figure out what, you know, I think that's a whole sort of strategic layer that I think a lot of times people don't think about. They're like, oh, I just want to share interesting stuff. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you've learned a lot about what people are interested in from the response to different things that you share. Is there anything along those lines that sort of 
stands out to you that oh, whenever I share this kind of creator or this kind of thing or this kind of story, people seem to be more interested than others? It's honestly been all over the board. Yeah. Like I'll think that a lot of people won't be interested in like this newsletter called Bite Bite Go, which is like about tech and I don't know system design mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it's i'm getting so much good feedback about it and i'm like this is awesome i love that people are just like open-minded enough to realize yeah. they can learn from any kind of creator well and they also probably again this is a guess but I, at least i know it's true for myself i love justin welsh but people have heard justin welsh a million times talk about different things and they probably haven't heard i think being introduced to these other newsletters these other creators that maybe are from a slightly different space or whatever. There's a lot to, it's newer information, I'm guessing, to most of your audience. It's funny, I talked about this in another episode of my podcast where I was like, James Clear is brilliant. I don't know that I need to hear James Clear talk about habits on another podcast. I'd be more interested to hear him talk about something else just because I've heard it all, I've read the book, I get it, right? And I think sometimes that approach and finding those things that feel like, well, maybe this is a little out of left field can really resonate with people in that way. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm starting to learn about other creators that I didn't even know existed just because I have this audience and people are like, oh, did you ever look at this person's newsletter? It's actually mm. pretty cool. So give me, yeah, give me an example of what's the sort of most out of left field or surprising or thing that like surfaced on your radar that you had no idea about that really jumped out to you? There's been a couple of newsletters that have like multiple hundreds of thousands of subscribers and I didn't even know about them. There's this mm -hmm. lady named Lynn Alden. She does like a politics newsletter and I'm, I might do something with hers, but I'm not sure yet. But that was just like a really weird one. I'm like, all these people, like you just never know where they come from. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's funny. Like these days, like they're just people with massive audiences. And if it's not like on your radar and your niche, like you just have no idea. So let's get to my third and final question for you. I'm going to shift a little to talk about social media. Like you, I think you do a great job converting your newsletter content into social content. And so I'd love to have you talk me through how you approach that, what you found to be most effective, maybe some things you tried that didn't work, how you decide what to reveal, not to reveal when promoting your newsletter on social. I know you do a lot of, you don't reveal who it's about, but you will be like, oh, tomorrow you're going to learn this amazing story of blah, blah, blah. So just talk to me about how you use social and also if you want to throw in any other things that you've done to promote and grow your newsletter that you feel are working well. So I think with social, there are a couple of things that I do on a regular basis because they're really impactful. So the one you just alluded to is like teasing the newsletter beforehand. Mm -hmm. The day before, I will write a little post and I did steal this format from Justin Walsh because he's like the master at teasing his newsletter. But essentially, you just, you know, you write a good hook. Of, I can't even think of the one I did recently, but <laughs> I'll just write a good hook of like basically their main part of the story that was interesting and that people would find valuable. Mm -hmm. And then I say in the next tweet, I'll say join however many people and don't miss this issue tomorrow or whatnot. But those actually do really well. And I have subscribers who are on the newsletter who say, I wish I could subscribe again because this was so right. good. <laughs> like, it's just funny. But those usually get like 150 to 200 subscribers a week. So it's really wow. impactful. Yeah. That's amazing. So I'm curious, I'm curious if, you, and you may, I don't know if you know off the top of your head or not, but so you put, you post that sort of teaser and they're usually threads, right? It's usually not just a one-off tweet. So you post that sort of teaser thread and how many people do you think are seeing that? Like you're getting 150 or whatever you just said, new subscribers out of how many people seeing it? Like, I'm guessing that's a pretty high conversion. It is a really high conversion. And some of the ones that like don't get a ton of likes or um, views actually do really well. So it's like another thing, like the pointless numbers are the likes, but the, on the back end, like the really yeah. impactful numbers are the subscribers. I'm curious, how do you think people are seeing that? Because it's just a teaser tweet, I'm guessing, or thread, I'm guessing it's not the kind of thing that people are really sharing. Like you said, they may not even be liking it that much. So it, do you think it's just basically reaching your Twitter followers who somehow have not yet subscribed to your newsletter and that every week that many of them are now converting over? I think it's a combination of things. So a lot of my Twitter followers will like and be like, I can't wait for this issue tomorrow. Like, I'll make sure to check this out in the morning or whatnot. But then a lot of people are actually bookmarking that tweet. And I think that impacts mm -hmm. it pretty good. So yeah, so a lot of my like raving followers, like the people that I'll retweet as yeah. well, they'll comment and just say, oh my God, I can't wait. This is so exciting. Or they'll get yeah, I think I think bookmarks are having a big impact on the algorithm. 
I noticed I had a tweet a few days ago that had a ton of bookmarks and got a ton of reach, way more bookmarks than likes and retweets and replies combined. It's interesting that you said that though, because it occurred to me that maybe those people that they're using that bookmark as a way to remind themselves to open your newsletter. I Could would be. assume if they're all, like the people that are already subscribed and that, so that's actually, that's really interesting and something I've not specifically tried, but I wonder if it'd be a good experiment to even call out, say, Hey, bookmark this. So you don't forget to check it in your inbox to like actively encourage that action, knowing that bookmarking is then theoretically pushing it further in the algorithm to more people. But, yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if they're doing that or if they're just like the next week, they want to go back and see what I wrote compared to what the tweet was. Right. I didn't know who it was. I don't know. It's interesting. Or also maybe as an example for themselves of I want to promote my thing and they think it's a good example of promotion and they want to save it for that reason. That's Could also be. possible. Yeah. So what else? What else goes into how you approach this stuff? So most weeks, I've been really bad at this lately, but I'll write a thread about the previous deep dive that I wrote. I would write a thread on Ben Mir with System Sunday and just share the top growth levers or a few interesting things. And at the end, I'll say, go subscribe and I'll send you the issue now. So that's been really helpful. Are you too. using any social platforms other than Twitter? I do post on LinkedIn sometimes, but I've been mad no. about that. Yeah. What about what anything else you're doing besides the pre and post tweets to, to grow it? I mean, I think like we were mentioning before that just the DMs are so powerful. If you see a tweet you like instead of well, you can comment, but then you can also reach out to that person in the DMs and say, hey, I really love this. Just, you know, build that connection. And then later on, they're going to start seeing your stuff and engaging with you. It's funny, like you're on the one hand, you're well into your journey. And I don't even know how many subscribers do you have now at this point? I just hit 12,000 this morning. Wow. So things are going well. It's also only been six months, which is wild. What would you say to someone who is kind of where you were six months ago and they're getting ready to start? Maybe they're not sure. Maybe they have a general idea of what they want to do, but they haven't actually done it yet. And that's always different. What would your advice to be to someone who's in that starting point? I think the first thing is just start. You're going to learn so much just by actually doing the thing and writing the newsletter and making mistakes than you would if you just like research and plan more. But the second thing is just find an angle or a piece of content that you're really excited to write and just dive in on that because that's going to take you further than, I don't know, any of these growth hacks will. <laughs> and what would your advice to be to someone who's, let's say they're three months in, right? So they've started, they've been relatively consistent. They're publishing every week. They've maybe got a few, you know, they built a little bit of an audience. They're seeing a little traction, but they, they've gotten past that launch phase, right? The excitement and nerves and everything of the launch. And now they're like, all right, well, now where do I go from here? I would say dive deep into relationships, start replying to other people's newsletters. That's been huge for me just to build that community aspect and start doing cross promotions, I think is a great one. Any of those like recommendations platforms are good. So the Creator Network with ConvertKit or Sparkloop, those have been huge for me just to, yes, get new subscribers, but also build relationships with other creators and you can learn from them and help them as well. Are you doing paid stuff with Sparkloop or has it, have you done any paid promotion of your newsletter or just cross-promotional stuff? Just cross-promotions at this point. Do you have any tips in terms of the actual reaching out? It's funny, both of us have been like, yeah, build relationships. Those are really good. You guys should do that. Any tips or examples of sort of ways that you've actually done that? I mean, I think one of the big ones is joining a community. So I'm part of Jade's lab, Jade Klaus's lab. Mm -hmm. That's been huge just to, you know, get on the radar of other people, learn from different creators, that kind of thing. I've seen a lot of the people I've studied take a course. You know, some people take a Twitter course and then you end up building those friendships. Mm -hmm. So I think that could be a really big, simple way if you have a little bit of extra income to spend on this to not only learn what works, but also get in with those creators who are looking to grow as well. As we wrap up here, like what's your, where do you see this going for you? What's your ultimate goal with it? Where do you want it to be? Has that shifted at all from when you started it out? Where is your mindset with it now? When I started, I was just creating the content just because I thought it was fun to do. It's only been six or seven months now, so it's really still very new for me. But I think I just want to be able to help people build an audience, not necessarily 50,000 subscribers, because I don't think everyone needs that, but just be able to actually build a sustainable creator business and grow that way. I mean, I'm sure I want to do some kind of, I don't know if it's a course or membership or something, but I'm still trying to figure that out. But some way to help more people at scale versus just creating a deep dive every week. And you view this as a business? 
for you? I mean, was it yeah. always intended to be that or was it initially just a kind of a creative exercise that's now becoming a business? Yeah, it was just a creative exercise. Like I still have some clients on the side from my past digital marketing stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would love to take this full time because I'm just having so much fun and learning so much. But yeah, it's for me now I can see that it's a business. But in the beginning, I was just trying to figure out how these people were growing newsletters. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And then one final question. You're six months into it. Has it gotten easier or harder? Both. <laughs> I think creating the content, I feel like now that I know a lot more, I'm going deeper into these things. So it's mm -hmm. taking me longer to do, but it's also easier because I'm in like a groove, if you will. So it's both harder and easier, I'd say. Well, congratulations again. It's a really great newsletter. I highly recommend anyone who likes my stuff. You absolutely will love Chanel's newsletter. Let people know where they can get it, where they can connect with you, where they can build relationships with you and all that other stuff. Yeah. So it's growthinreverse.com. And then I'm also on Twitter or LinkedIn at Chanel Co. And for me, my newsletter for theinterested.com slash subscribe. My skill sessions, joshspector.com slash sessions. And it's funny, I actually was just thinking about as we were talking about this episode, because it's all about like newsletters and social. The most recent skill session that I just published is actually the newsletter social playbook, which is all about how to use social media to grow your newsletter and vice versa. And I believe I actually include an example. Actually, I know that I include examples of how Chanel promotes her newsletter in there, which she probably hasn't even seen yet. So I need to send you that. And then other than that, I'm on Twitter all the time at Jay Spector. If you would like to come on this podcast and ask me three questions, go to joshspector.com slash questions to submit them. And hopefully I can be talking to you on here one of these days. Chanel, thanks again. I appreciate it. This was great. Really helpful. Thanks everyone for listening. Have a great week and I will see you next week.